Thanks so much, Maria. It's really exciting to present um, and to be in this context, particularly this kind of draws on years, of, I think, of conversations about fair and ethnography mm -hmm. that we've had in numerous projects. Um, so I'm going to start um, a new share and I hope... <laughs> I have got to agree. <laughs> I hope that's all good. Um, okay, well, yeah, thank you. So I'm going to, I thought I would start, I need to have a sensory opening for a talk that deals with the senses. So as you say, Maria, I will explain what that means to do sensory <laughs> research, but I wanted to um, start by kind of making you aware of your own senses at this coffee meeting. And I wondered if anyone knows what this is. Um, this picture is up here. It's a coffee wheel. So it's a, a tool that's made um, especially so you can train your sense of smelling and tasting coffee. So um, you can go to a coffee tasting class and you can uh, use a tool like this to help you give um, enhance your vocabulary for um, tasting coffee. Um, so I just very, sh very short experiment and to collect some data is I wondered how, what kind of words do you already have for how you would describe the coffee that you are drinking now or that you had this morning? How would you describe it? Yeah, I found uh, a new uh, Nespresso flavor and uh, it is called fruity. Fruity, uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. Winery. Fruity and winery. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So you you describe your coffee as the place it came from and some of these words you learnt from the, the casual description. I would just sour. I think my espresso I don't know is a bit too sour and plenty. Mm. Just for that, but I haven't found the correct way. Yeah, Le so less sour I is less sour. what you were yeah. voting for. I find this like a bitter and a bit strong. Like mm. yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Bit of, uh, yeah. I think it's a mango with intensity, so either mild, a mm. bit more intense, a bit more strong. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're you're describing a bit more the impact it's having on your body yeah. that it feels like you've got this intense mm -hmm. feeling from the coffee. Oh, no. That's true. Okay, nice. I'm very aware that those of you online probably can't hear all these answers because the audio is coming from my computer, but we're having talks about intensity, about aroma and smell, and maybe if you want to add some of your own thoughts in the chat, you can also contribute with how you would describe your coffee. And um, what I think is really um, interesting from these descriptions, so this is, I have taken some coffee cupping classes in Melbourne, uh, which is where I come from, which is like obsessed by coffee and mm -hmm. enhancing our ways of describing coffee. And um, what I find uh, so interesting in these, um, when you think about coffee, is that there are all these words you have to describe them and you can be trained to enhance your vocabulary with all these flavor words. But actually, if you want to describe what it's like to be drinking your coffee, you also need other kinds of details. So you need to describe the, the material feeling of the cup that you're drinking it from. It might be the setting of the kitchen in which you're drinking the coffee. It could be who you're having the coffee with and the conversations you're having while you're drinking the coffee. If you're having a really tense conversation about what you're going to be doing that day and who's managing the kids, it could be a very like ten, um, stressful coffee drinking experience, or it could be more relaxed if you're at a cafe. And I, I describe all of this because these are the kinds of descriptions which ethnographers are interested in. So we're not only interested in these flavor words, for example, for the coffee or or how many people are drinking this coffee or how many grams of coffee are sold from Colombia to the Netherlands. But we're interested in these really descriptions of, I loved your description of the intensity of the coffee on your own body, because it's actually a description that an ethnographer would be really interested in mm -hmm. and also interested in their own experience as a researcher. Like how does drinking coffee feel for me as a researcher in this setting? 
So this kind of basically, I hope, gives you a bit of a sense of how complicated the data is that we're dealing with in ethnography. It's filled with these rich descriptions, which we um, record in notebooks. We record by sound, we record with videos and sound recordings. The material is very rich and, and complex, and we need a lot of like different media often in which to record it in. So I basically want to um, introduce, give you a sense of what uh, doing ethnographic um, field, field work or research is like, because that's going to be the basis of my um, talk, is to try and think about how FAIR relates to a qualitative research, but specifically ethnographic research. And I want to do that because basically until now that there are very few people in my field in qualitative research, especially in ethnography, mm -hmm. that really have embraced FAIR and they're really actually antagonistic against it for lots of reasons in which I'll describe in my talk. And what I basically hope to do in the talk is um, I, I, I sit in a camp where I think that, that, yes, there are things we have to think about with making uh, ethnographic data uh, fair, but I think that we can explore more um, ways of doing that that's ethical, that's legal. But what I'm also more interested in is ways in which we can do that which are creative and which help to make the data meaningful for reusability and interoperability. So rather than just do it for the sake of doing it or because we have to, how can we actually use some ethnographic tools to think creatively and imaginatively about FAIR? in relation to ethnography. So that's basically going to be the message of my talk. Um, I was describing to Matthias before, that's one of these talks where I'm going to build on some previous research projects and experiments we've done, but I'm also really going to be feeding off your questions into working on new projects. So um, as Maria is aware, she's worked with me on a recent, um, two recent proposals that I've written where we're really trying to like push FAIR and ethnographic data. So I really actually will be using some of our discussion for um, developing new projects. So it, this, the talk kind of sits between these projects. Um, what I want to do, because I, I don't know how many people here in the, I, I could see some of the ethnography group in the Zoom audience, but I wonder how many people here um, know what ethnography is. I know Maria does, <laughs> she's done a PhD using this. Is anyone else very familiar with it here? <laughs> so I thought maybe you might like to hear us if in the words of your fellow colleagues here at Maastricht University and from the ethnography group, just a few seconds where they describe what ethnography is to them. Um, they're not going to give you the textbook definition, which I can describe in, in a few sentences as being a methodology whereby a researcher will go into a community. So, for example, you would go to a, a coffee tasting workshop or spend time with baristas and you will learn what it means to make coffee um, or to, to do or cafe, you could understand the cafe culture, you could understand what it means to train coffee tasting. But the research method is that you go into this setting, you take notes of various whatever mode you use, and then you analyze this material using theories, which come from often social theories and other literature as your analytical tools to help understand um, your communities that you're studying. But I'm going to let the ethnography group, and I hope the audio works, to um, describe what ethnography means to them. For me, ethnography is going places, meeting people, and coming back with challenged assumptions. Ethnography is um, diving into another person's uh, skin and culture. Uh, this does not have to be far away, it can be your neighbor's uh, culture and try to understand the world through their uh, senses, through their eyes, through their uh, smells, through their ears. So um, to try and understand how the world looks like for them. Ethnography is a bodily sensitivity that enables me to feel other cultures and to capture their particularities in writing. Ethnography. For me, it's wisdom that sits in places 
It is words, it is people, it is things, it is faces. It is a journey of the self with its tracks and its traces. Ethnography is about making sense. Ethnography is to kijk naar de mensen en te luisteren naar de verhalen achter de nummers. Ethnography is a form of close noticing, but it's also the kind of noticing that can happen out of the corner of your eye or in a sidewards glance. What ethnography means to me? These are masks by a Ghanaian artist, and they're made from the same kind of wood. And one could argue that they are all quite similar. But when looking closer, one notices that some are, have long faces, others have round faces. Some look directly at you, others look to the side. So rather than just lumping these masks into one category, one realizes all of the diversity. And that is what ethnography is to me. Ethnography is making connections and learning through them. that is um uh yeah uh, that is the ethnography group so this is a, an open group we've been meeting for the last 10 years anyone's always welcome to learn about ethnography but as you can see from these videos um ethnog ethnography deals with very complicated material when it comes to fair we've got faces we've got um uh object bodies um it's very ethically um interesting uh, uh, material we've got long-term commitments with communities so we in to do ethnography you have to build relations of trust with your communities and that often creates tension when it comes to making their data because it's often co-created data accessible to others and so, as you can imagine, ethnographers have long really safeguarded their ethnographic material from sharing it with others. So there are um, uh, lots of reasons for this. One of the arguments is that it is built on these relations of trust and that the researcher doesn't always own the data, even though the university does own the data. There's this, this idea that it's been co-created with those you're spending time in. There is the argument that it's quite a colonialist exercise, that you extend the idea of extraction of data from communities by then putting it into repositories and making it extractable by others. There's also this um, discussion, and that's often like an intuitive feeling that ethnographers have, is that how could anyone make sense of my data without having been there? So if you haven't been in that cafe, how could you ever make sense of someone's field notes from that cafe? And so it's that that I want to kind of think through creatively with this idea of decontextualized data, because I think this comes up also in other fields and more quantitative data sets as well, is that you have this problem of decontextualization. How do you give context to a data set which it might contain all numbers or it might contain data, but you, if you want it to be reusable and interoperable by others, it needs to have some context so that you can understand where this data comes from. So I hope in that way we can connect across fields and explore um, possibilities. So I recognize a lot of these concerns because I did my research in Australia in an Indigenous health um, centre. So there are, um, this is a place where my fellow PhD students who worked with Indigenous communities could not only not make their data open and accessible, they needed um, permission from, to quote and to have every photograph in their thesis, even if it was only read by one person, it was all a matter of negotiation with the communities that they were in. So I'm very aware of the ethical and legal um, and cultural challenges of this. And I also think it's very practically challenging to make the kind of material that we have openly accessible. So um, I'm showing here some three images from the kind of field work that I'm involved in. So for the last six years, I've led an ERC project where we um, have done ethnographic and historical research in medical schools around um, Hungary, Ghana, and in the Netherlands. These are the kinds of sites where we spend time in. There's a lot of materials. There's a lot to pay attention to. So we have 
an, an enormous archive of videos, sound recordings, photographs, field notes, interview transcripts. And also the historian has gone into the archives of each of these places and scanned documents. So as you can imagine, when it came to uploading our material in Dataverse, which is a process that Maria helped with, it took weeks to upload this material, um, which I didn't do, the research assistant on the project did, but it was practically really challenging. We learned so many lessons along the way. We didn't tag our material properly. We Our readme file, we still have to create. I mean, it's really a nightmare dealing with all of this material. And so, which makes me want to I have discussions in forums like this because I think we can think through better ways of dealing with this kind of material but that's not really the point of my talk today but I am really interested in how we can do this differently with ethnographic material um so I uh I also want to put ethnography into a changing uh, context, which is that for a long time, maybe if you think of an anthropologist, it's a single anthropologist who goes to a single place, often a tropical island, if that image comes to your mind, and writes in um, a field notebook about this place. Whereas actually uh, ethnography is really changing and it's starting to happening in teams. So when you're funded by the EU, especially you need to do team research and um, it's becoming lots more common for ethnographers to work in groups. And so this already raises the question of how do you share data in a group in a way that is um, findable to the other research members, um, accessible to them, also interoperable in the um, point that when you do a team ethnography project, the point is that you're learning through comparison of each of the sites. So like any comparative project, you need to work with the material to make the analytical comparisons across these sites. And this is enormously challenging. And so what I wanted to explore today as like an inroads into potential ways forward for ethnography and FAIR are some of the experiments we did in our research project in ways of sharing really complicated material in real time so that we could do this kind of comparative analytical work that is required in um, team ethnography. So what I'm gonna do with the rest of the talk is describe why sharing material has become, I, I think I've described why it's becoming important in, in ethnography. So you can't just be the lone person sitting at their desk for the next 20 years writing your monograph. You have to really work in teams. You have to share this material with others in some way. I want to talk about how we did it as a team. And then I want to discuss experiments that other research groups are doing with sharing ethnographic data. And then I want to end off with how perhaps within our um, the things we did in our team experiments of sharing data could be expanded into how to share ethnographic data and qualitative data with others um, in the in other research communities and how this might have lessons for quantitative data sharing too. So that's the the remaining 10, 15 minutes of the talk. So I'm going to skip. Um, this bit because uh, if you want there's a video on the UM ethnography group if you go to it you can also learn about team ethnography um, so there's a section there are quite a few team ethnographies happening in the Maastricht University um, I can add, send the link in the resources as well but I want to describe to you what we did in our research project which was that we did um, we really realized and I'll, I'll raise my voice a bit over any um, jackhammers um, is that um, while we're doing field work, it's so time intensive. I mean, you've really, like you're just spending your time recording, being in these places, recording material. You kind of, you don't want to go to sleep at night without getting things on the page. So it's intense. So the idea of then sharing material during this period of time is really impractical, but really important because you've got this precious period of time of field work and you want to make sure that the comparative element is really honed and really sharp and so you want to make sure that you're doing this as you go as well as not just at the end of the um, research project so we came up with a solution that we would give ourselves field work activities so we call them probes or activities where basically it was designed as no to take no longer than 15 minutes Everyone in their field sites, we were doing field work at the same time, would do one small sensory activity. 
And this could be, for example, like here's one of them I've taken from our field work. Um, and we made these up as a team together is to climb up on a table. So it could be here in the classroom and to take a picture and then send that to everyone in the group. Mm -hmm. And so there was just like little interventions we did in our field work. And they sound maybe a bit silly or a bit small, but it's amazing how much it reveals about the field site. So for that one, for example, the researcher who was in Budapest, she found out she was not allowed to stand on the tables. Like it's a really traditional uh, medical school and she would have really crossed like cultural taboos by standing on the old wooden, you know, tables and benches in Semmelweis University in Budapest. So she, um, just by this simple exercise, we started to learn more details about the sites and how there were norms and practices that could be instigated just from a simple activity. So it told us about the sites, but what it also did is it started to generate this data um, set, which were just little snippets or windows into each of the field sites, which may have been a sound recording, it may have been a, an image, it may have been a quick sketch or a drawing. But basically over time, and we did 26 or 27 of these field work activities, we developed this rich data set of photographs, three photographs, three drawings, three sound recordings. And then we used this material as ways of of understanding each other's field sites as we went on. So it took only 15 minutes to do, and then it took only 10 minutes to even listen to. Sometimes we would have a phone call about them, sometimes not. So this is what we did in our um, group. I've written about them um, with uh, the other two PhDs on the project. So the three of us have numerous publications I'm happy to share. Um, this is just a little insight into some of the things we did. So we tried to record the smell of our three places in photographs. We drew maps of our places. We, um, and our maps were very different. One was a map of the city. One was a map of a building. One was a map of a body. So there's, we took these um, invitations. We recorded ourselves learning a technique because you, as you can imagine, our project was about learning skills. And this is a really hard thing to try and co collect in data. How do you learn something? I mean, it's just a, it's a really, uh, there's a lot of researchers here that study learning, but I think everyone would agree that how to collect data on whether someone is learning something or not is really challenging. So we try to record ourselves learning a technique in a video. So this is the three of us learning the same technique in different time, in different places. And um, yeah, so I share these kind of like activity maybe as, as prompts for discussion. Um, and I'll come back to how it's relevant with FAIR in a moment. But I also just want to share that there are some other people also thinking about interesting ways of making ethnographic field notes open and accessible. Here I'm referring to um, an artistic collective in Copenhagen called Sisters Hope. I won't go into all of the details, but essentially you sign up to have a one week immersive artistic experience in this um, site and everyone writes their field notes from this. So you write, keep a diary, keep all these notes, and then they create an archive of all these field notebooks, which is accessible to everyone in the uh, that comes for the experience. And so I really was interested in um, talking to them about this, like how do they make other people's really personal reflections of this intense ex artistic experience. How do they ensure that there's trust and that these notes can be shared with others? Um, and so they described to me, they've got really interesting things in place. They've got a keeper of the archive, a person who is uh, specifically dedicated as the keeper of the archive, which creates a human element to the sharing of the ethnographic material with others. So I thought, I started to think, what would a keeper of the archive look like for an open ethnographic archive? You know, is this more than just the contact person on an open data set? You know, what might that kind of role look like? Um, we've got, yeah, there are other experiments. There's a group at the University of Vienna who have got a, um, what they call an ethnographic archive that they're creating. That's um, that, that what they're basically trying to do there is think about from the very beginning of a research project, how can you create archives of ethnographic material? So these are like, uh, basically what I want to think through with these are also the 
this this question of the main concern of that this material becomes meaningless without context and that um, essentially sharing this material is one thing but what does it mean to make sense of things and can we challenge this um, problem of decontextualization by returning perhaps to our experiments that we did in within a research team so I want to come back to that because I think if the challenge is to how do we respect participants in an ethnographic project and these field relationships while sharing research, at the same time making data meaningful to others, maybe there's something in these ethnographic um, experiments we did which is um, interesting to think through. So I've been reading a little bit about how others have been creating context for their data sets. And I don't know if many of you or any of you were at Kathleen Gregory's um, fair coffee talk mm -hmm. last year, was it, that she gave her, her talk? It was this excellent talk and she's just done this beautiful PhD in the, the faculty we, where Marie did hers and I am based on reusing data. And she finished her fair coffee talk talking about data stories and how she is creating data stories around data sets to help give context to them. And I've looked into these data sets. So what are people doing with data stories? And they're sometimes called context data. So this kind of context data, and I'm sure there are many more of you in the room that know more about context data, but it helps to contextualize data sets and it can take lots of different, so it, it give, it's more and a above um, metadata so it gives a kind of broader context about the research that, that was the data was conducted in so um, the university of vienna um, group experimented for example with adding biographies of the, each of the researchers involved in the data set collection as a way of giving context mm -hmm. data they've also um, used timelines and researchers trajectories in collecting the data as context data for the data sets I've also seen examples, so as along with the README file, there are sometimes visual diagrams of the data set that you may have seen. So I'm trying to think of what might it mean to have sensory data stories about data sets. So could we, for example, think of including videos or photography or sound recordings, podcast interviews, um, drawings that are anonymized drawings, which don't include people's faces, but an artist has worked with the researchers to create visualizations of the data sets. And so essentially, I, I would love to just kind of leave that open because this is basically where the new work is taking off, is how um, the sensory methods that we've developed in other research projects might make not only ethnographic and qualitative data research sets accessible by having an accompanying da sensory data story, but perhaps uh, a numerical or quantitative data set could also have an accompanying sensory data story where you've got a, a video of the laboratory where the um, chemical experiments were conducted or you've got one of the, the PI um, talking about what inspired the project. I mean, there are so many possibilities with um, context data. So really just in conclusion, I wanted to um, uh, say that while it's often celebrated, open science is often celebrated across many disciplines, the humanities and social sciences really has been reluctant and slow to kind of come to the party. So um, ethnographers in particular have perhaps been one of the most reluctant of the research methodologies. So what I want to think about is not only how to uh, make ethnographic data, uh, perhaps ethically and uh, legally and practically more um, shareable, but also to explore some of these more creative and imaginative possibilities and how that might also feed into FAIR as a general um, practice more generally. So that's where I um, I am. I think this all needs a lot more uh, thinking through. We're in collaborations with IT staff, libraries, mm -hmm. across faculties, um, the, with the uh, ethnography group. I realised the importance of thinking through this from the very beginning of writing a research proposal, mm -hmm. of putting in the budgets. I mean, a budget, we've, we've already had the discussion, do we need to allow extra budget for a data repository that has so much multimedia material, for example? So all of this needs thinking through from the very beginning, but yeah, I'm really, I wanted to leave about 15 minutes for questions 
Um, so yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts and comments and questions. And um, thanks to those who also joined online. And um, yeah, this is part of this project. So yeah. Um, well, um, see which one. Uh, yeah, I'll do it first. Um, I think I don't know. Like, do you know a lot about fair about the landscape or uh, what's happening at the moment? I, okay. it, like an average researcher. So, yeah. Uh, fair started off as guidelines, so mm -hmm. the the fair landscape is very broad at the moment because there's different communities and they have different implementations. They have different wishes and different ways of doing fair yeah. and. Um, they, they're trying to converge that a bit. So what what's happening, they're describing the different wishes and the different choices that a community made in, in profiles. Mm -hmm. um, and with the idea to promote reuse of tools, of technologies, of choices, of everything. Yeah. So to me, that sounds a bit like a sort of self-ethnography. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I was wondering, does that even make sense? Is that feasible to do that and to try to align um the fair landscape more or yeah what's your opinion as an ethnographist on the this yeah fa great qu great question i don't i think can you could you hear ragna could you hear that question can you hear the audio the quiz sort of so i'll just repeat it it was the question is um about the fair landscape and how um whether um and maybe could you clarify what the what you thought by self-ethnography how it oh, related to self-ethnography they're asking the communities to describe their um the ways they do fair the, the, the choices they made regarding right yeah yeah technologies that Right. Regarding tools, technologies, regarding lots of lots of things. Yeah. And uh, trying to create profiles, and then trying to create convergence of the whole landscape because it's so broad. Everyone is doing fair in their own way, and they're trying to mature it a bit more and yeah. see what are the best ways. And if I want to collaborate with that department or that community, how do I do that? Are they making similar choices yeah. to what we're doing? So yeah. in that sense, I thought like. They're trying mm. to describe the community and it sounds yeah. like self-ethnography. Yeah, 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 great. I love the potential um for that. I think it's true. I think you what you do, there is this kind of community just description work happening. Yeah. And it seems like I would say an ethnographer would be really interested in not only the um mission statements and the um descriptions of what you ideally want to be doing with FAIR but they'd be much more interested in what's actually happening mm -hmm. in the so I think if that was um if there was a description of yeah. the actual practices mm -hmm. that happened it could be an ethnographic project yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah I've been doing that a little bit of classes um mm -hmm. and I often have these discussions with them like the open science community and other colleagues to say we do FAIR differently at this faculty yeah we do it in groups because we create vocabularies mm -hmm. groups to share the ethnographic data and whatnot so yeah but it's not really immature it's just the an idea of yeah it's great yeah. it would be really nice yeah mm -hmm. the, the the other faculties do something similar yeah as yeah. to yeah. So we see how yeah we connect so not yeah yeah mm -hmm. but yeah there's and it's, i think it's a very like while it could i think ethnography could be a method you'd dedicate your whole life to yeah. but we also teach it at our faculty at least in eight, an eight week block which is mm -hmm. it's, and it's often just about honing observational skills that you already have and using them in particular ways so i often think it's quite a transportable tool in terms of using it for projects like this about yeah mm -hmm. descri describing communities mm -hmm. yeah yeah another question yeah i have another one okay uh so i was thinking uh, a lot of the communities i work with often uh talk about being re-traumatized re or re-victimized mm -hmm. by various ethnographers going to the same place mm -hmm. and doing the same field work over and over again uh -huh. um so do you think the uh, fair open science could be a way to uh -huh. to resolve that issue and can we do that by co-constructing data sets with participants? I don't know if it makes any sense, but yes. to engage in this open science practices with the participants, so where they decide what, what they want to share, what they not want to share, uh, and so on. So. Uh, yeah, I think that is such a fast. I'm sure there's people either in the room or in the group online that would have expertise on this. And I know yeah. at, de, certainly in Australia, amongst Indigenous communities right. who are taking so much ownership of, rightfully so, of the, because they've been exploited. I, I, 
in my department, anthropology mm -hmm. was a really dirty word because basically anthropologists yeah. were those that were extracting all the materials and stories and songs um, so there's a lot of things and I know Canada has um, really developed this so I think there are indeed I think there are places where it'd be wonderful to invite some speakers that also yeah. work with Indigenous communities or are really thinking through these over-researched right. um, and yeah, at traditionally exploited uh, yeah. sites. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, great. Would, yeah, I think there's a lot to learn <laughs> from people who do that. Mm. Well, I have another question then, mm -hmm. if no one else wants. So you were talking about decontextualization. Mm -hmm. um, I think we at the clinical data science uh, department, we often see that medical data is used as plain data without connection to the care path and then mm -hmm. that creates a lot of mistakes so um yeah it, it, there's less interpretation and the usability diminishes so we, it's a big problem for the re, reproducibility of research and of of uh especially data science uh, research projects yeah. so sensory data and data stories as mm -hmm. sort of metadata to data sets mm -hmm. i want to take it like a step further mm -hmm. like with all of the with big amounts of data that are being analyzed by AI and machine learning, is it possible to make something like that machine readable to be able to mm. Uh, um, mm. yeah to be incorporated in the analysis and uh, mm. give a better contextualization? What's your view? Mm. Faster. I mean, th this is totally out of my realm. <laughs> machine learning. Mm. I mean, I I feel like to be honest, I feel like ethnography is so often a counterpoint to machine learning. And I, I say that because I've I've thought about this a bit with a political philosopher, is what, what is it that an ethnographer does that's different from a machine learning from a lot of data? And when we talked about, I think it was a bit in my description of what ethnography is, it's this sidewards glance. So often it's the and I'll come back to your actual question about the clinical data, but I think what ethnography allows is a kind of noticing that only humans can do. Yeah. And I think that that doesn't mean that it's better than machine learning or that it does it has to work oppositely. I think it can work, but I think there's something specific about the kinds of details ethnographers record mm -hmm. that's different but what I do think um what you really highlight I think because and maybe I say that controversial and I'd love to hear your thoughts on whether <laughs> ethnographers really are any different um and and I don't set that up to be like because what we ended up with the article is like how amazing to work in collaboration to think through like mm -hmm. this more um but I do think like I, I can't help but think I was at the welcome um medical galleries in London uh, the science museum um medical galleries they're very new um in London and they're they're beautifully fitted out and their task was not to make clinical data more um relevant but to make objects like dusty old medical objects to mm -hmm. give them some kind of life and they used patient stories so they had um they've inserted into the gallery patients telling stories and so that is a way of giving some context to all these objects and I I do wonder whether and I know patient stories and the patient advocate and the mm -hmm. patient repre represent representative is like well thought through but it, it does make me think what are some of these elements the context that's needed yeah. does, I think I we do use these do like you? in, in mm. the, um, um, let's say clinical decision support system they can either be for clinicians or for patients but the one for patients by talking to patients that it's often more interpretable but also better um, if we put in like patient stories not just mm -hmm. about uh have a uh if you do this radiotherapy uh you have um less function in your arm but then like a story of someone who couldn't reach the upper cupboard and couldn't couldn't play tennis anymore like like trying to um make it a bit more practical and also uh there was a yeah a wish 
by the patient representatives to, to hear stories like that to make it more tangible for them yes yeah. so we, we tried to use that but i think this was more regarding the interpretability of the data that we always right. need to talk to the domain experts because a lot of the these nuances get lost when you're just looking at right yeah data so yeah. there yeah i understand yeah. i think one way to that we work around it is also to create really really rich metadata mm. on something like dataverse because that is machine mm. readable uh and then uh candida i don't know if you have uh, who was a, uh, a research assistant to anna also thought about how can we code the stories in a way in which they become also readable by a machine mm. so i know that she's currently mm. working with SSPI and uh, maybe another software uh i don't know exactly what it is but we've been discussing yeah how can we make also the metadata really really fair yeah. that's for yeah. sure so anybody in the world can access it and see that the material is there but then there will also have to be another way to transform these objects into something that's yeah 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 yeah. Like yeah sorry now i i do i misunderstood yeah the question before indeed that's really fascinating and really to be thoughtful through now really from the very beginning yeah. and not as a way of coding afterwards this material no. yeah and sorry if I didn't repeat the question to the screen but it was about like how to make um how to make some of the sensory data machine readable which is yeah really interesting mm -hmm. how do you deal with complex data that itself needs more complex data to be explained? <laughs> yeah <laughs> So the question is, how do you deal with more context? How do you deal with context data that needs more context data? Indeed, then we're in a we're in the spiral. Huh? Okay, so for, for medical data, some context might be quite easy. Like this population was poor, or yeah. I don't know, they're Dutch, they're whatever. Yeah, uh, that doesn't necessarily need that much much more extra context. But if you start it in, in biographies or something, like. Yeah. Where do you stop? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Depends yeah, yeah. It, it's true. And I think maybe to answer in for both questions, I really see these like the need for experimentation in um projects like F team ethnography projects to to start to even just start exploring what it means to give some uh -huh. context data. And then it might be, yeah, we don't want to get trapped in we don't want to spend all our time like just with the data set too we also want to do other things like write books and do that kind of stuff so i yeah. think that um it's labor intensive it's labor intensive indeed and so it's like thinking but i and also whether the how a data keeper and a machine learner um gatekeepers how they might differ or what it means to do all this i think i think it's a great question and i think that um there would be a resistance to even going down there because you could never i think that's ultimately the ethnographer's argument you could never know yeah. without having been there and i would counter that with like well maybe you can get a bit closer to make yeah, but, but in, in medical data you can say okay at this point it's no longer relevant mm -hmm. for ethnographer's data i think that's a lot more difficult to say it, well, especially it especially because we work with our data for like 20 years okay. <laughs> so yeah it's like yeah. always changing yeah Indeed, that's right. So does it stop when a computer takes over? <laughs> <laughs> it's over to you. <laughs> yeah, it's fascinating thought that like, could a computer now, if we uploaded our data set, could a computer write the monograph that I'm trying to write right now from mm -hmm. the from the project? I think it's a great question. This is the question for those online about how do you um, control for th these varying um, interpretations, but that it has possibilities too. Yeah, yeah I, I totally agree. And I think that like we've had great discussions in our ethnography group of um, say there's an ethnographer working with undocumented workers. Um, so as soon as you've got someone doing a legal activity, you've got a lot of ethnographic ethical issues about what it means to record their story. So, um, and there's all kind. I'm on the ethics committee in, and we see all kinds of uh, situations where you're like, do you, what does it mean to even record this, um, which could have all kinds of interpretations that are for le police, legal, um, could read it differently. And, but what I also think too is the, the possibilities you highlight are that we've got one ethnographer interpreting the material one way. Maybe they share it with their communities, maybe they don't, but what does it mean to like think through with a different lens for 
to, mm -hmm. that you've got this amazing resource and the possibility to think through. I also think that it's going to become more relevant when you think of um, back to the machine learning conversation. I think of like um, I was reading about the the model they're building for um, wildfires, for example, based on um, uh, data, geographical data about you know. Uh, weather conditions and they've got all this quantitative data about what predicting a wildfire but the missing data is human behavior like who how people start fires why they start fires and where where does you know does ethnographic data have some kind of input in these big cross kind of disciplinary data sets which have all this information but you're really missing what people actually do so, and that could help interpretations of other data sets. Yeah, I think, oh, great questions. Sorry, I feel like we've kind of gone a lot over time. Nice. So I'm happy to do them. No more questions? Well, I guess, thank you very much for the very interesting talk. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. you, Anna. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs>